11, 2018, I remind my colleagues to please silence all electronic devices at this time. And we have a guest with us to start off with this afternoon, um, Matt Houck with the American Heart Association is going to um, address us and then we'll go on with the rest it's of it. September 25th. Yeah. Oh, the right. September 25th. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew Houck, and I'm with the American Heart Association. Thank you for allowing me a few moments of your time. Slide over here. Perfect. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. As you know, the American Heart Association is dedicated to reducing heart disease and stroke. And if some of you have seen our new mission statement, we are now a relentless force looking at the overall health of the human body. Within Virginia Beach, the Heart Association is dedicated to not just the physical well-being of uh, children yeah. and individuals, but the mental well-being, which I believe directly ties into what it is that we're all trying to accomplish here within Virginia Beach. So every year, we recognize five school districts within each state. And this year, I am very happy to announce that Virginia Beach was one of those districts. Yeah. So, what that encompasses is not just the school district's efforts um, financially to support the American Heart Association and our cause, but the outreach of uh, messaging and education to all of our students within the school district. So, not only did you place in those top five, but you are number one. Number one. We have set the bar in Virginia for what it means to educate our youth, and I hope that we will continue to do that this year. I don't know about all of you, but I like to be number one and stay number one. So. Um, with that being said, I'd like to present this to Dr. Spence on behalf of the American Heart Association. Thank you. Sir? I thank you all that you do. Thank you. No problem. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So where do you come from? So, do you want? I'll get you. Um, just one quick announcement. We will go into another uh, closed session right after our formal meeting this afternoon. Uh, and um, uh, Ms. McLeod will not be with us today. She has a work obligation she has to be out of town for. <clears throat> Does anyone ha else have anything to share with the board in admin matters first? Ms. Rye. Uh, so it was in the last few weeks and... and uh, just want to, I know we have multiple schools every year celebrating anniversaries, but Green Run High School is one of my adopted schools this year, and I did want to announce that they are going to have a, a year-long celebration of 40 years. You know, we have some within our alumni in our midst right at this table. So very excited, and, and they're, it's a great plan on how they're trying to draw in um, alumni engagement with regard to their events moving forward. And speaking of Green Run, in a doctor's office yesterday, there was Virginia Magazine, and the uh, cover story said, you know, top 20 statewide progressive districts uh, for, for specific programs. And I scrolled through the two or three pages, and sure enough, Virginia Beach is, was on the list, and specifically Green Run's iLab was cited by Virginia Magazine which we had a previous workshop on. Short for, I think, Innovation Lab, Lab yes, Dr. Spence? That's correct. Okay. And maybe I'll leave it to some of my other colleagues to talk about the food bank that we were at yesterday. Okay. Mrs. Riggs? Um, I just wanted to say that we uh, attended the um, uh, Union Council 80th reunion with uh, Dr. Spence and Sharon and Dottie and several other kip was there uh, several others daniel was there sharon, sharon. there was there we had a table full um <laughs> and it was very very nice i was uh, impressed uh dr smith spoke 
he shared some really significant things that I'm not going to say. I'll let him do that. <laughs> but that was the first time that they had been shared, and I thought it was an a, a, a great place for him to do that. I thought that was great. Um, and if you looked at the paper, if some of you still get the paper or even online, um, there was a uh, graduate from the very first class of Eugene Council. She was 98 years old, and she walked up to receive yeah, her plaque. Awesome. It was uh, it was awesome. And I just when I saw that come across that invitation, I'm like, I got to go to this because being a, a product of the system and born and raised here, you know, and, and a council graduate, it just kind of resonates with me, Union Council. I just remember it, you know, all my life being there. So um, I just, I thought it was so important. And uh, I was honored to be able to go there and represent Virginia Beach. So. Mrs. Felton? Yes, I have two things. I'd just like to say that on September the 19th, I had an opportunity to attend the Teachers Forum. Very informative. And I was honored to sit at the table with Dr. Robinson and Cheryl Bird, who were the facilitators. It was really great. I sat with Birdnick Elementary, College Park Elementary, and Green Run Elementary. And it was a teachable moment for me as well. Uh, a lot of, um, they gave a lot of uh, kudos to the leadership department, saying how the leadership department is really beneficial to them. And they're not accusatory, but they do come out to help them and put them in the, in the right direction. And one key word was floating around, it was called the Schoolology champion and I had to ask uh, Dr. Roberts to tell me what that was and uh, he let me know that it was an individual that that give one-on-one -on -one to the teachers and teach them how to use schoolology and lead them into uh, understanding what the system is all about. The teacher form was all around just a learnable situation for me. The teachers were really excited about going to uh, next year agenda and putting things together. Also, I'd like to say that I attended the Oceana Air <coughs> Show. Over 5,000 fifth <coughs> graders were there. Yes. Oh my God. It was it awesome. Yes, really. And leadership was there. Showing up, Miss Shran was there along with some of the other ones running around with all of the students. Uh, <laughs> Miss Morrissey and a lot of the principal, they were having big fun. And so it, just to see the students out there enjoying themselves with the STEM thing that they had going on. And I had the audacity and the I got brave and crawled up into one of those big uh, airplanes. <laughs> it was really great. Uh, I enjoyed it all. And just to piggyback on what uh, Trine said, uh, the Princess Anne County Training School and UK 80th anniversary was phenomenal. Uh, um, Dr. Spence uh, <coughs> uh, represented us really well. And, and from that gathering, Mr. Kiever created his own fan club. So Mr. Kiever has fans that they with the uh, Princess Anne County Union Kinsfield. It was a really great turnout. Um, uh, Dr. Spence gave an invigorating acknowledgement, and most of the students that were there really appreciate all that he had to say. It was really great. Thank you. I'm just going to open it up and let you talk more about it. But we went about to the food this? bank. Yeah. 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 Um, so we almost went to the food bank. Um, what was actually called luncheon, simula stimula simulation. Um, I was going to talk about it yesterday. Um, Carolyn Rye. It's it was actually it was, called the elected officials engagement day, and so not just school board members were invited, but city council people from all the, all of Hampton Roads and all school boards from all of Hampton Roads were invited, and uh, so the only three elected officials who showed up yesterday were. Mrs. Rye, Mrs. Riggs, and me. <laughs> However, I was, I'm so thrilled that we got to go because we got to do an exercise in um, what people have to go through when they sign up um, to get their, I don't know what kind of card it's called, back in the olden days. Snap. What snap, snap? Their snap card. EBT. In the olden days, yeah, for EBT. for oldie oldies like me, uh, <laughs> it was so called food stamps. But they don't give stamps anymore. They give cards to people, right. like a, a card, a debit, for, a debit card. And so, um, but the but the exercise that they did with us that teaches these people, you know, what they have to do. Actually, it's too bad that they don't go through this particular exercise that we did yesterday for everybody that signs up for it because. It was phenomenal, and um, these were the pictures of the foods that we picked up that we would have been allowed to buy 
Um, not even all of these, about half of these is what I would have been allowed to buy for one month with the amount of money that the particular make-believe family that, that I was in yesterday. I was in a make-believe family where it was a mother and a single mother of two, two sons. And, um, and she didn't make much money, but she did have a job and in this particular family. And, um, anyway, it was a really good exercise, but it also talked about, I mean, it, it gave us the, the insight and in how you have to stretch your money and what you have to think about in your nutrition. And, but may, mainly how you have to stretch that money to make it last for that, for that month and what you could buy with your little card and what, and how much money you would have left over if, from your real budget, from your, your family budget. So anyway, I plan to talk to our teaching and learning about this particular exercise and maybe encourage uh, maybe in one of our economics classes or some one of our classes that we can maybe uh, do this exercise with the students because I do think it's something that would be beneficial for any young adult to go through where they learn to have to stretch their money to make make ends meet and all of us go through that at times. Mm -hmm. so. And it's students managed. were recognized from Brasco and <coughs> High School that had entered the contest. Like they had a, they had an essay or... contest, and the number one winner was from Grassfield High School. But um, we had a winner from uh, Princess Anne High School, who was uh, our winner from Virginia Beach, who uh, had taken third place in the essay contest. So it was very worthwhile, and I'm I'm glad I went to it because it was definitely um, informative. Yeah, very Hispanic. Um, so I haven't been here in a couple of weeks, but I need to brag on my colleague Miss Weems for the event that. She put on on August 31st um, to raise awareness for opioid abuse in our, not only here locally, but nationwide. And um, we had a representative from Virginia Beach Schools, Nicole DeVries, came to you know, talk about what we're doing in education for Virginia Beach Schools um, to help students and to promote awareness. It was a, a rainy evening, but the clouds cleared just in time for us to have the race. And then a rainbow came out with just an, so amazing clouds at the end, and it was just wonderful. So um, it was a, a very successful event that she put on. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Should I have anything? Okay, Dr. Spence, we're ready for our workshop on BASE, the Alternative Behavior Program. Certainly. Um, board will remember that <laughs> some time ago, Dr. Cashwell was presenting on social and emotional learning, and one of the things that she mentioned that we were working on was an alternative behavioral classroom setting for our elementary age students. And so several of you have had questions about that, and we indicated we would be doing a workshop on that. So here to, to do that for us is our new Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Kip Rogers. And so first of all, I want to welcome him to his first official board meeting with us, and uh, we'll turn it over to him for this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Good evening, Chairwoman Anderson, Chair, Vice Chairman McDonald, school board members, and Dr. Spence. I am delighted to be in Virginia Beach Public Schools. I, I really am. Uh, we're number one, as evidenced by the award that you all just got, so I'm super excited about being here. I made it through my first week, and I can <laughs> truly say the first week was like drinking water from a fire hose coming in with district this size, but I had a great time. And I culminated the week with over 5,000 fifth grade students, and I couldn't have asked for a better way to end a phenomenal week. Everyone's been so warm and welcoming, so I thank you all for the opportunity. So this afternoon, we are going to provide you with a high-level overview of where we are with our behavior and social emotional program for our elementary students. And I do have two of my colleagues with me, Dr. Alveda Green, who is the Executive Director of Student Support Services, and I also have Dr. Karen DiMaggio, who is our Coordinator of Psychological Services, who will certainly help provide answers to questions at the conclusion of the presentation. So that being said, I will frame the context of the presentation. We'll talk a little bit about the background and how we got started with the program the development of the program, student criteria for selection of the program, the process that we use for referral for the program, the academic structure of the program. We'll talk a little bit about some brief data that we have to share, and then we'll certainly conclude with our planned next steps. <coughs> so as Dr. Spence just alluded to, the BASE program is a behavior intervention program that's designed for elementary students. And the conceptual framework for the BASE program is grounded in goal three 
of Compass to 2020 that meets the social emotional development of all of our students. And the goals are certainly to uh, assist students with experience who are experiencing significant difficulties with learning how to self-regulate, how to develop coping skills, and to learn the social skills that are required for them to be successful in school. And I apologize for that slide nice. advancing by itself. <laughs> but as you can see from the slide that you have in front of you, the base committee was comprised of about 20 staff members that were principals from the elementary schools, central office leaders, as well as social workers, psychologists, and we even had the a representative from, well, the coordinator of our guidance services also participated on the meeting. And actually, I found out about the base program in our one of our assistant superintendents of instruction meeting. I think Dr. DiMaggio came and shared a little bit of information about the program with all of the school districts, school divisions in our in our region. So I knew a little bit about it before I got here. But the committee was formed, and as you can see, they met regularly to devise the makeup of the base program. So the base program committee and developing the structure for the program, the staff in the Office of Student Support Services research school divisions in Virginia that have elementary behavioral intervention programs in place for their students. And there were two sites that they found that were similar to Virginia Beach. The first one was Newbridge Learning Center, that's located in Rico County. The second one was the Burke Alternative Learning Center in Fairfax County. And from their research and those visits from those two, from those two programs, the staff learned that through conducting their research and the visits that behavioral pro programs for element elementary students best meet the needs of those students when they teach problem solving and social skills. Additionally, they found from the visits that staff were better able to understand the importance of ongoing parental involvement, especially as it relates to focusing on the transition process when students enter the program as well as when they leave the program. And lastly, the committee decided in conjunction with the Office of Student Support Services that they would offer the base program to students in grades K through five for up to 12 students at any one given time for a period of time between four and nine weeks. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So additionally, one of the things that came out of the committee was that the base committee agreed that they needed to start with early intervention with our babies, the students in grades K one and two. So that's where they started. Uh, this past school year with one classroom in grades K-1 and 2. <clears throat> and the plan this year is certainly to expand the program to meet the needs of students in grades 3 through 5. The site selected for the program is Brookwood Elementary School and the purpose for selecting that school is proximity. It's centrally located uh, in the school in the city and is also in close proximity to the seven other field test elementary schools that were selected to participate in the program. And there's a nice mix of schools to participate in the program. We have Title I schools, there are nine Title I schools, and there are schools that have diverse student populations that were selected to participate in the school. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the structure of the program and what are the components that make up the program for support and intervention. If you see the graphic focuses on five general areas. So the first one is a character education component. It does have a character education component that reinforces the development of social emotional skills that students often need. So for example, teaching students how to ask for help when they need it rather than acting out or how to self-regulate their own behavior instead of acting out or even how to hold a conversation or make a friend instead of acting out. So it focuses on that character education piece. The mental health groups are run by clinically trained psychologists and or sometimes social workers. Those lessons are provided daily and students have an opportunity to work with them on helping them to identify what they're feeling and also to develop positive pro-social responsive, responsive, pro responses as well as positive behaviors while they're in the classroom. Goal setting is a key component to the program as well. Positive reinforcement as well as applied behavioral analysis are also focused as students are taught to be accountable for their own behaviors. And that's a skill that they will need when they transition back into their home schools. All base staff are MANT trained. You may remember from one of your, your previous meetings, some discussion about what MANT training is. 
And it's this training that emphasizes establishing positive student relationships, clear communication, as well as best practices to intervene with student behavior. Students receive small group instruction as they do in all of our elementary schools, and they have access to all the same curriculum and all the same tools that all the students that in their age group have, so it's not to fall behind when they return back to their, own, their home schools. So I'd like to focus a little bit on what the criteria are for selection of students to be referred to the program. So students are selected the criteria for student selection are based on their need to ensure that students in the primary grades receive early interventions in order to develop social skills that are needed for them to be successful in their class. As mentioned earlier, a large part of the success of the program are involving parents, and parents are involved from the very beginning, from conversations with classroom teachers to conversations with student response teams, administrators that are involved very early on. So, Student response teams in the field test schools collect data to show patterns of challenging behaviors for students whose behavior had a significant impact on their learning. And it's important to note that for some students, classroom and group-based interventions are just not enough. As such, these students were referred to a third tier of the SRT process. So they've tried several things in the classroom with the schools and they've reached a level where we need to do something different that's more individualized to support their needs in the classroom. So prior to the referral of the BASE program, all those criteria that included interventions and parent communication are needed to be in place and monitored as well as documented. And in addition, school administrators observe the student, document behaviors, and then they provide support to the teacher all along the process. So now I'll share what the referral process is after students have met that criteria. The referral process follows the student response team process and, and is completed by a student, by the school student response team, apologize. And that's done in collaboration with the base team, the base team staff. So base team staff are invited to meetings with parent permission and they consult with the student response team. They complete an observation and then they review behavioral data that were collected some time ago. Afterwards, a collaborative decision is made to place the student in the program or not to place the student in the program. If placement is determined to be appropriate, then parent permission is obtained and a base intervention plan is developed. And that plan does include specific behavior goals for the student and those goals are measured on a regular basis with the base team as well as with the SRT team. And then once the student is enrolled, the base team and the student response team continue to collaborate with each other on assisting the student in being successful for the period of time that they're in there. And then if placement is not determined to be appropriate, the base team still provides some strategies to the SRT team that's in the school to help the student be successful. And then they continue to monitor that student because it was he or she had been referred. Okay. And again, the parent is always connected. And we've talked about most of the bullet points that are on there, but I want to draw your attention to the daily parent communication. The daily parent communication is such that students are provided with a positive point sheet, so they, were, they focus on the positive things that the students are doing, and they also make regular phone calls to keep the parents abreast of what's taking place in the classroom. Another unique piece is that the base staff, they plan meetings about midway through the students uh, time at the base program to talk about where the student is and how they're progressing throughout the program. Another great thing is that there are opportunities for parent trainings and workshops that are being planned and implemented and are designed to support parents once a student exits the base program to continue that cycle of support and to provide them with strategies that the student learn while during the base program and additionally to help them during the summer months once the program is over. So some of those folk, folk, some of those workshops will focus on parents learning to reinforce those skills, such as establishing boundaries with students and communicating what expectations are and following through with them. Okay. And partnerships with the community agencies are certainly in the developmental stages and they'll provide support to parents and their children in the home as well as the family through individual therapeutic counseling services if they're needed. So as I shared before, the student transition is the center of support and interventions. 
that are provided in the BASE program. And actually beginning with the end in mind, the plan for successful transitioning a student back into their home school actually begins <clears throat> or is determined once the student enters the program. So they begin thinking about how can we support the student once he, once he or she gets back into the school. And as was shared earlier, students attend the program anywhere from four to nine weeks. And that transition is a true collaboration between the base program, the home school, and the parent. And to ensure that students stay connected to the home school, a staff member from the home school will visit the base program student at least once a week. So that could be a teacher, it could be a, an administrator, it could be a counselor, it could be any staff member at that school that has a connection to the student. And the purpose behind that is to keep everyone in the loop for that student's success. And then once the student returns to the home school, visits will be made by the base staff to continue to provide support for the student as well as the teacher, and they will help them with some strategies should they be needed. And um, it's important to note that each student leaves base with a comprehensive trans transition plan that includes goals that are designed to support the student and those goals are measured. So in preparation for the base program, lots of things had taken place in preparation. I've not spoken about most of them, but I wanted to direct your attention to the des designing and the setup of the classroom. So you might ask, well, what does the classroom look like for the base program? And during my week, I did have an opportunity to go over to the base pro program and meet most, if not all, of the staff that were connected to the base program. And I was quite pleased with what I saw. So in the next slide, you'll see what's referred to as alternative seating that you might see in any classroom. I would argue that these are probably some of the more creative I've seen <laughs> as an educator and I actually wanted to go into the one on the left because yeah. it was just warm and inviting. The teachers call them cozy corners mm -hmm. and students are able to self-select <clears throat> whenever they have an opportunity to go in and read or complete assignments or if they are self-governing and they need to have a moment they are more than welcome to take and choose any one of those areas to go and spend some time in. And I also had an opportunity to do some reporting and just ask some of the staff members, you know, how do you feel about the program? And I spoke to Laura Baines, who was one of the new teachers. She'll be working with the upper grades, and I have her on video, and she was gracious enough to oblige me. So I want to just play, it's about maybe a 20 second excerpt of what she thinks about the program. Yes, there is. You know, no resources like that, especially for the K through five, when you have, you know, the behavioral problems and things like that, so that we can teach them the social interactions, take, teach them, you know, some um, behavioral techniques. And that's not something that's there for general ed, and I think it's going to be a great program. Oh, yeah, the video had a little bit of challenge, but that's okay. You get the gist of it. But it was refreshing to speak to them with regards to how they're providing support for students who need some support in behavior management. Her classroom is not quite yet done. I'm looking forward to going over there again this week. She's still working on some pretty creative things. So I didn't do the big reveal for her, but I anticipate her room will be just as nice as the others. So, the so what behind, what are the results? The base program was open to begin evaluating students in January of 2018. And prior to student enrollment, a meeting was held with all principals of the field test schools in order to share information about the program, the student criteria, as well as what the referral process was. And then the base team then worked closely with the schools who referred the students. So fast forward, although many students were evaluated based on their behavioral challenges, ultimately we had seven students who were referred to the base program during year one of the field test. And of those seven that were referred, four actually attended and were served in the BASE program. Of the four students, all of those students transitioned back into their home schools, and all four students showed improvement with behavior and have a transition plan in place that will help them to be successful this school year. So a little bit about the program staffing. During the first year, the structure of the, the staffing of the field test we had one K-2 classroom. It was one certified teacher and a teacher assistant. In addition to those instructional certifications, teachers who work with base students also have experience 
and certifications and working with students who have challenging behavior difficulties. The teacher assistants also have expertise and training for working with difficult behavior. The base program in year one of the field test was supported by one full-time and one part-time clinical psychologist, as well as one part-time licensed clinical social worker. The full-time psychologist for base also provided psychological services to Brookwood Elementary School, and then the part-time psychologist provided psychological services for two additional schools. The part-time licensed clinical social worker provided social workers, social work services support for two other schools as well. And those uh, same staff are still providing that same structure of services to those schools, that, um, the base program as well as the other schools that they were serving uh, for the second school year. Uh, with both classrooms in place, the base program will be able to serve up to 12 students at a time with a maximum of six students in each <coughs> classroom at any given time, so it's rolling enrollment. And as space opens up for the program due to transition back and forth to the home school, the rolling enrollment is the goal, and ultimately we'll be able to serve far more than 12 students over the course of the school year because we begin accepting student, students in October. So what are the fiscal implications? There are three right now that, that we are uh, uh, considering. One is there uh, has been reallocation of central office positions in order to provide instruction positions. There's transportation, transportation for students. And then there are the materials that have been provided by the Office of Student Support Services in order to make the program run. So we're looking forward to expanding the program this year to our students in grades three through five. And at this time, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And those that I can't answer, I'm going to call on my colleagues, Dr. Green and Dr. DiMaggio, to assist. Are the parents required to attend the workshops? Is it a requirement to yes. attend the workshop? I don't think it's a requirement. Uh, they'll be offered, offered multiple times throughout the course of the year. Okay. Miss Manning? Yes, ma Great job. I can't believe you've only been here a week. It's a great job. Um, so when did the initial um, pilot begin? How many years ago? The initial pilot started last school year, mm -hmm. um, and the enrollment of the students began in April. Uh, prior to that, our base team, they were setting up. Thank you. The base team, they were setting up the first classroom, uh, ordering materials in the interim. They also were going out to support schools uh, until to working with our student response team. And finally, we were able to enroll students starting in April. Okay, okay and then, so I just want to make sure I have this straight. You had four that went through the program and transitioned back, correct? Yes. Okay, and then... You said that there's going to be 12 students in each class, but a maximum of six students. Uh, so, clarification, okay. there'll be a maximum of six students between the two classes, so each class can hold up to six. Oh, there's students. two classes in each school? In Classroom? Two, class, cl cl two classes at the one school at Brookwood. At Brookwood. Correct. And then when will the other schools transition in? They, so those 12 students could be made up of any one of those eight oh, schools. The, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. So I, I apologize got it. for thank you. I got it. Not being thank clear. You. Mrs. Felton. Uh, thank you. Presentation was good. Thank you. Appreciate all that you've done and the show span of time. Uh, and again, welcome to Virginia Beach Public Schools. Uh, you mentioned that um, uh, the base is another level for students where we're going. So can you compare this base to the PBIS or are there any comparison there? That's a great question. PBIS would support a program like BASE. And for example, Brookwood was selected because it does utilize the PBS structure of uh, building a culture of positivity throughout the school. So it works in conjunction with and not instead of. So you mentioned transportation as well. So give me an example how a student coming from one school to another, how would their transportation work? How so my understanding is, and Dr. Green, you jump right in, is that we have vans, is that right, yes. that are picking students up. Okay. Um, so it's pretty much door-to-door -door service because it's a small student population. Okay. Oh, uh, vans, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a way to do that. Thank you. Thank you. 
We, uh, Mrs. Weems? Yeah, we're using this white bands. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time I've heard it. I'm going to love it. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Rogers, and welcome. Thank you. Um, did, do you know, okay, so seven were referred and only four went, or did all seven go? Uh, four of the seven. And four of the seven. Do you have any data, like, why would the parents not want their child to attend this program? Do you have, did you get any feedback, or did they... It's not necessarily that they didn't want them to attend. It's that the after the referral process, the base team determined that three of them wouldn't meet the, the guidelines. Oh, okay, okay. Because I was thinking this is such a good program, I would think everybody would be <clears throat> positive about it. Okay, so seven referred, and the base team decides who qualifies. Okay, right. okay, great, thank you. Mr. Yes. To the base team getting involved with the help supporting the SRT team, and the students made progress. So the parent kind of decided, okay, given that they made progress and we're moving towards the end of the year, they felt like they wanted to finish out the year to see how that, that and that's really kind of a pattern that we saw. Oh, that's good too. That's yes. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Edwards. Delivery of academic content. You've got multiple grade levels in this, and I, I've got to ask from a space allocation, we've got two classes. Do we have one classroom with a divider in between, or do we have two, actually, two separate classrooms with six students each? They're two separate classrooms. Really? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, but an, a, a day involves uh, delivery of academic content along with all of these social skills and everything. And so. Yes, sir. The, the students that participate in the base program will receive the same academic content as they would had they been in their home school. That's the the the. Um, the expectations. The difference is they will focus on the social emotional learning aspects that uh, we talked about um, earlier. So they won't have anything different than their peers do academically, instructionally. Multiple grade levels and a single teacher, though, they're just differentiating big time. Right? Well, the good news is that we have. Well, but yeah, but yes. you still got, yeah, but three grades for each teacher. Correct. Okay. Is there a teacher assistant involved with any of these? Yes. Yes. In, each yeah. class. in each class. Okay. Yeah. Mrs. Rye. So one's an observation, just the the intense staffing commitment. I think the only thing that would compare probably is the neediest of our special ed kids. Um, so I think that's worth noting. Uh, it might be a premature question, but what happens at the end of the nine weeks for the the little the young man or woman who hasn't advanced to the point we would hope. So whether they need to stay, is that what you're saying? Well, the program is designed for short term and not a long term uh, period. So um, I think there are systems and practices in place that would uh, be there to support the child. I would imagine that if a child is not meeting success after the period of time that was determined with the base staff and or the SRT, that that child could be a candidate for evaluation for special education service not that they are but they could be so that's one possibility or for whatever else exactly right. so. that's what i surmised or again and i would be the first to say well try to try back with at the, at the home school but if it really isn't working we, right. then that too could be reevaluated right correct thank you <clears throat> Um, that's that's all the questions I think that we have right now, but welcome, and this is a great uh, first time for you, but we welcome you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. <laughs> so next up, we have a Capital Improvement Program, CIP. <laughs> Mr. Arnold. That was crutches. Oh, well, yeah, that's right. Rock <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm off the DL. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm going to use this. Okay. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Anderson, uh, Vice Chairman McDonald, Board Members, Dr. Spence. Uh, I've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going uh, I'm going to motor through this thing. Uh, if you could save any questions at the end, I'd appreciate it. But uh, before I get started, we uh, in the back, uh, raise your hand, Ryan. Ryan, uh, Ryan Hersey is our uh, new mechanical systems engineer. 
uh, who's on day uh, 38, uh, slash energy manager. Ryan's uh, an Old Dominion graduate, who actually wrestled yes. at ODU. Uh, he's a, a licensed uh, professional engineer here in Virginia, a mechanical engineer. So Do you play uh, football for them? I heard they have a team. <laughs> <laughs> I was just asking for a friend. <laughs> VMI is 0 and 12. We're not worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, first, the uh, the big projects, uh, Die, Thurgood, and uh, which Die, which I'll, I'll go over in just a second, Thurgood and PA Middle, which uh, about $136 million. Again, I know you've heard it before, but these are uh, modernization replacement projects, 32, 33, and 34, that are uh, uh, just north of uh, three-quarters of a billion dollars. And I'll book in that at the end of this. And I'll talk a little bit about our long range plans. Uh, John B. Dye Elementary School. Um, we're about we're about 16 months in uh, on this occupied modernization project. Um, uh, it's a it's about 43 percent complete. Uh, they occupied their new admin very late in the summer. Um, it is uh, I'll call it organized chaos. Um, it's uh, it has been a struggle and it continues to be a struggle. Uh, we think that uh, that overall they're about 90 days behind. Um, that's a, a combination of um, you know we've had a we're about 11 or 12 inches uh, up from the norm on rain this year. We had a, we had a wet summer. Uh, that's that's not all of it. You know we've got poor performance. We've got uh, what I've been talking to you about lack of skilled trade people. So we're feeling the impacts of that like a lot of people are. Um, it's not for a lack of effort from, from our staff. Uh, they're in the process of putting a recovery schedule together, but they, they are behind. Um, and it has our, our attention, I can promise you that. Uh, and again, we, uh, you know, it's, it, it is difficult uh, running a school building and, and for Beth and her folks to do what they need to do every day while we have uh, an occupied $26 million project going on uh, that's phased. Uh, so I, we try to remind folks to uh, keep an eye on the rendering. The front of the building is starting to look like this. Believe it or not, if you drive by there, you'll see that it's starting to take yeah. shape. So that's there. There are encouraging signs, and, and these things do get finished, and we do leave. <laughs> uh, they get tired of looking at us. Uh, this is the uh, on the bus side and the other side of the building. You know, you'll see that the front of the building actually changed. The front of the building faces Great Neck Middle. Uh, this is where the, the new bus loop will be, uh, and you see um, this is our most recent aerial. It's a September aerial. Um, and the, uh, the new part of the construction is, is the, the, the white roof looking that's got the admin, the gym, and the uh, new gym in the cafeteria. Uh, we tore down the old gym at the bottom and you see the, uh, the bus queuing uh, is, uh, is, is taking shape down there. Uh, we've, got, we've got a ways to go, folks. You know, we're going to be there for, for probably another uh, 21 to 24 months. Uh, Thurgood Elementary School was just awarded. Um, we've got a formal groundbreaking set up for uh, October the 19th. Uh, the contractor had uh, has a notice to proceed on site last week on the 17th. Uh, you'll see some activity out there now. Uh, we've been using the building. Uh, we partner with our um, with our police, fire, rescue uh, folks, and uh, that use old buildings for training. Uh, and so we do that when we before we tear a building down. We're, we're uh, we've been doing that for about the past month. Um, uh, but uh, you, we, we'll see a lot of activity here over the course of the next uh, 30 days in terms of, uh, of demo. Um, building is scheduled to be complete uh, in 2020. Our, our hope is that, uh, that we can get the kids that will be fifth graders in that school year in there in the spring uh, and get it done a little bit early like we've been able to do, like at ODS when that, that building opened uh, in April. Uh, and a, a rendering from the front. Uh, an interior rendering. Don't get too hung up on the colors, folks. We're not. We haven't picked colors yet. It's not going to be. Not, I don't not, like orange. We're not a fan of bright orange. Yep. Okay. Uh, Prince Anne Middle School replacement. Um, uh, groundbreaking set for October the 11th. Recall that we uh, we issued a demo contract this past winter. The building was torn down. Uh, R.J. Smith did a good job. Um, contractor got a notice to proceed uh, in August. Uh, they're actually pouring footings out there now. Uh, completion scheduled for 2021. Um, same, uh, really, same uh, design and construction team that did ODS. Uh, RRMM project architect Rob Burrs, uh, Tim Coles, the PM in our office, uh, and uh, McKenzie Construction. And again, some early renderings that uh, um, 
give you an idea what the bill is going to look like. And a September uh, aerial as well. Uh, seaboard is, is uh, along the left side. And again, this similar to John B. Dye, the, the building orientation will change. The front of the building will actually face Leroy. Um, not, the building won't have a real back, uh, but uh, all, all sides of the building look good. But if, you've, if you're familiar with PA Elementary, PA Middle, and what's going on for there forever in terms of bus and car traffic on Seaboard, uh, this will help immensely because we separate the car and bus traffic uh, coming from different locations. So that, uh, that should help with uh, long-term traffic. Um, so uh, summer infrastructure, uh, we, uh, we've got just under about 15 million uh, that I'll go through real quickly that we do, uh, we did this summer. That's not, uh, I won't go over all the operating budget projects that our maintenance services folks do every summer, um, but uh, about $20 million in total. Um, a, a big one, two summer projects, Salem Middle School, uh, re-roof and partial HVAC replacement, uh, about three and a half million dollars. We finished phase one uh, uh, on schedule and we'll come back. Uh, we, we do work into the shoulder months a little bit, uh, but that part of the building is dried in and we'll be back uh, next spring to finish phase two uh, next summer. <coughs> it's too much. We don't like to roof during uh, school year. Just uh, too, you're asking for, asking for trouble when you do that. Uh, Holland Elementary School to make up air unit replacements uh, was, was done on time, a little bit, about a quarter million dollars. Um, combined uh, rooftop units at Creed, some, uh, some mechanical equipment at Larkspur, and some, some old ductwork we replaced. Uh, sounds simple, but uh, $1.35 million uh, all done. Um, uh, we, hopefully, this is the last time we touch mechanical equipment at Creed's. We've been over there for the past three summers. Uh, that's in part a product of, um, you know, when you're struggling for funding, you, at times you can't get as much done, and so you end up touching a building uh, multiple times, which, uh, which we don't like to do. Uh, some makeup air units at First Columbia High School, a uh, rooftop unit at, uh, at uh, the Tech Center, uh, about $375,000 was done on time. Uh, uh, baseball, softball field lighting, uh, we use some reversion funds for the baseball field, that's done. Uh, we've um, uh, we've started on the softball field lighting that'll be done uh, at at the end of the year, uh, so those fields will be uh, will be lit with uh, with with Musco lights. A good project. Um, Strawbridge Elementary School gymnasium HVAC uh, cool and tower boiler replacements at uh, at Redmill Elementary School uh, almost a million dollars. This one's worth noting. Um, <coughs> a sign of the market. Uh, is when uh, factories are really busy. Uh, we're always first one out in terms of our work to get it down the street early. Uh, mechanical equipment's a long lead item. Uh, in spite of that, if you have what I call one-offs, a piece of equipment here, a piece of equipment there, uh, you get put to the back of the line uh, compared uh, with respect to other larger jobs. And so uh, the, the rooftop unit for the Strawbridge uh, HVAC project actually just showed up and got hooked up. They've been using temporary cooling, but that that's a product of the marketplace is really busy. Factories are really busy, uh, and they can't push stuff off the assembly line fast enough. So uh, we're going to see that for, for quite some time. But uh, all the projects are done, um, and we're ready for uh, when kids came back. Uh, Lansdowne High School, it's hard for me to believe that that building is 17 years old. Uh, you know. Tracks are, uh, these rubber tracks are meant to last eight to 10, but as much use as they get, uh, you know, and, and if, you, if you behave properly on them, you'll get six to eight years. Uh, but we just went over there and uh, um, spent about $325,000. I just finished the striping. That track gets a tremendous amount of use. If you ride down Prince Anne Road on the weekends, you'll see track meets there all the time. Good public asset. Uh, Kempsville High School Entrepreneurial and Business Academy and Locker, uh, I should call it Locker Removal, really. Uh, this is a project we packaged together with two different funding sources. Um, this has been another struggle. Uh, the, the lockers, if you've, been, if you've been in Kempsville, it's interesting. It's the same building as Kellum, First Colonial and Bayside. I went to Kellum High School and we had 3,000 kids there. Um, uh, removing lockers and widening the hallways makes a huge difference uh, in how that building feels when you walk through it. Uh, we've, uh, I was by there yesterday. Uh, they've got charging station, what we call Apple Bars, set up. So um, that part is coming together. Uh, the entrepreneurial spaces, 
they're um, they're about 45 days behind, and it's a contractor we've never worked with. Uh, I don't think we'll ever work with them again. Uh, they have just not performed. Uh, they're in over their head. Uh, we're working weekends. Uh, we moved uh, all the furniture in uh, to the entrepreneurial space uh, late last week. Uh, we hope to have them in there uh, teaching next week. Uh, the school has been very flexible. Uh, Melissa George and, and Megan Temple have done a great job. It's, it's a tough thing for a first-year principal to show up and you've got a construction project <laughs> and you've got a contractor that's not performing. Um, we cannot do the work for them, uh, but they're going to be held accountable for the lack of performance. So it will, we will see this. We're starting to see this. Uh, again, keep an eye on the ball. Uh, you know, the, the, it will get finished. It'll be a great space. It really will be a great space. It's got great furniture. Uh, it's going to do an awful lot for, uh, for, for that old 1960s school. Okay, uh, floor finish replacements, essentially uh, carpet replacements uh, at Ocean Lakes and Lansdowne High Schools, about, about $400,000 was done. Uh, same thing, some uh, beat some tile replacement at uh, an old school Kings Grant, another uh, almost a, a half million dollars. Uh, and for the first time in my career, uh, using capital funds to, to paint uh, two buildings. You know, we can't keep up with the eight to 10 year painting cycle out of the operating budget. You can see you spend almost a half million dollars painting two high schools. Um, so uh, we use capital funds for that. Uh, Plaza uh, Annex parking lot, the first phase of, uh, of getting out of the Alaskan Road Annex. Uh, that's a $13.3 billion project that we're programming right now. Uh, the rains hurt them, but we, it's a good contract. The first time we've worked with Bissette, they've done a good job. We think we'll get them out of there before uh, before Thanksgiving um, and create uh, get rid of the mess that's been out back behind Plaza for a really, really long time. Um, and about this time next year, start construction on a two-story, 50,000-square-foot office addition that will get us out of Alaskan Road Annex. Uh, we do about a million dollars worth of... Um, uh, parking overlays, we, we uh, collaborate with the city's public works various roads contractor, uh, touch six or seven schools, we've got it on a schedule, we could do two or three million every, every year if we had the money. Uh, not sexy, but trying to eliminate parking lot uh, potholes and things like that. Um, you know, when you've got 2,000 acres of property, you've got a lot of exterior assets to take care of as well as interior. Um, this is really turned out to be one of the coolest projects we've done in, in, in really quite some time. It's a, it's a $2.1 million, uh, it's called 21st Century Learning Environment Improvements. It's, it's, it's become known as the uh, flip, li flip Your Library. And if you've, I've seen some board members around at Allenton and some of the other ones. We're done with uh, uh, 15 to 18 are finished. Uh, we, we started with 16, we were able to add two more. We added, uh, we added Hermitage and Corporate Landing Middle School. but uh, we use the funding from the sale of the, or the proceeds from the sale of the Adult Learning Center, that $3.5 million. We used part of that for this project. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, the library media center learning commons is the heart of every school. And so uh, I'm, I'm really glad to show you that Kempsville High School is one of them. The lot, you know, thankfully that was one of the early libraries that got finished. Uh, but it's been fascinating the transformation that's occurred uh, in these uh, in these learning common spaces uh, and with with new furniture. It's also demonstrated the talent that we have in our maintenance services department. Uh, all the demo and a lot of the casework and carpentry and cabinetry work was done by our own carpenters in house. So we have a just immense talent in freeing guys and gals up to go out and do great work. Uh, you know, so um, these have been really good really good projects. You see Holland, uh, you see the the last of the Pepto-Bismol pink laminate countertops uh, on finally from from uh, Holland Elementary School, but it's really made a huge difference, folks. It really has. Um, and finally, kind of to book in my, com my first comment about uh, uh, doing three quarters of a million dollars worth of, of um, work on 34 schools. Uh, you know, you, you formally accepted the long-range plan that kind of sets the, sets the course for the next 15 years, 12 to 15 years. Uh, we purposely picked uh, a, a 15 schools, uh, you know, an easy, kind of a small number of schools. We didn't try to put the next 30 up there. Those 15 schools in today's dollars, in 2018 dollars, 
are north of a billion dollars. All right, so that just, you know, we've been talking to you about what the marketplace is doing. Um, and so we've got a billion dollars worth of needs sitting here today in these 15 schools. Um, Dr. Spence just sent me an article about uh, um, uh, some projects in another part of the state where, you know, they're, they're, the same challenges exist in these buildings that are 15, 60 years old. So, uh, folks, we're going to be doing this for a really, really long time. When you own 90 of them and you own 11 million square feet of space, uh, you've just got to keep at it. You've got to be tenacious. So we've got to find a way to get it done. That uh, Thank you. that wraps it up for me. 529. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Ms. Melnick? Um, two things. The first one, did Lansdowne track sustain any damage from the tornado or is this just... Uh, a little bit. Yeah, we had some stuff flying around from, uh, from uh, some of the debris and we had a few minor tears. We were able to patch them. Okay. Uh, but the... the the, pro the project was just a result of it was time. Okay. And the other one um, is, are you, go are you going to keep the um, tennis courts at Princess Anne Middle School? I saw that the... No, ma'am. They're gone. Okay. Ms. Rye. Mine's quick. Is Kempsville, uh, is, is a part of that the, the fact that we're still adding a new grade level to the academy there? It isn't, I mean, that we, we do still have to add another grade level, but that project was planned several years back um, right. when we added the academy that we needed to upgrade their facilities so they could they could work in the, in the space they have. So they're creating a maker space and they're creating conference rooms for some of the students to work with their mentors. And so that was all part of the initial conversation around the academy. We had done some of the work in-house to get the program up and running, uh, but we had, we made a, we made a strategic decision um, if we had a different contractor, we might look smarter, but we made a strategic decision to package the lockers together with the Entrepreneurial Academy. And if you had a good contractor, we'd be <coughs> done. Uh, but we, have, we don't have a good contractor. You know, we'll be done. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So um, at this point, we're going to recess. Oh, forecast. no, we, we, have, we have forecasts. Today, don't we? Forecast. Why did I skip over that? <laughs> And are we, we mean, are we doing agenda planning? I don't know who that's with. Trace. Oh, okay. I don't know. I didn't see it. Wow. Okay. Anyway. Got it. Any more? Yep. Sure. Yes. And then the quarterly. Let me see. Our presentation. Our two videos. Let's stop that. So you got a copy in your hand of the quarterly forecast. Mm -hmm. Just as a reminder, this is the our sharing of what we think we've captured in conversations with you both collectively at the retreat and then individually, and then what what <coughs> some of the items that come up on an annual basis. And so, this is the second quarter forecast. I invite you to take a look at this for a few minutes. Um, I'll just highlight some of the workshop items in particular. We, we have planned a workshop on scratch cooking, which I'm sure you've seen a little bit about, and um, we'll talk to you a little bit more about what that looks like and where we think that's going and get your uh, thoughts on that. Uh, Dr. Banneke will come in and do a, a workshop to update you on where we go for our next strategic plan, you know, 2020, Compass of 2020, believe it or not, We'll time out at the end of the next school year. So in order to have one uh, in place prior to the end of next school year, we need to start that process now. Um, and she'll come talk to you about that. Okay. Um, you'll, uh, Farrell and his team will come forward with an employee health care benefit update um, end of October. That, that will be a substantive we think presentation in addition to what we anticipate will be questions from the board. So that's the only workshop we're scheduling for that date. Um, and then um, we've got a legislative agenda uh, conversation planned and a conversation uh, planned about out of zone waivers and just how that process works in general. A lot of, as you know, the uh, meeting in December is, is really um, put aside for uh, board and admin matters, but we will also have a legislative preview by Kemper Consulting if the board wants it, and then we will have a, pre, a little bit of a pre-budget discussion. 
and um, you'll have an annual report that you get on recruitment, staffing, retention, and compensation that will come at the end of November. So those are the workshop items that we've listed. Um, so I'm certainly happy to any questions or reminder, this is the board's opportunity to help us set the agenda. And um, of course, in the, this is something you will adopt next meeting. Uh, and so in the interim, if there are things you'd like to see added, just to reach out, let me know, and we'll talk, talk with the chair about that. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay, seeing none, then uh, we are in recess and we will reconvene on the dais at 6 o'clock.